On today's episode of the Unveil podcast, I sit down with Dr. Raja Selvam, PhD. Raja is a licensed clinical psychologist from the US. He is the developer of Integral Somatic Psychology, ISP, which is a complementary therapeutic approach based on effective neuroscience and the emerging paradigm of embodied cognition, emotion, and behavior in cognitive neuroscience and psychology. And it functions to improve cognitive, emotional, behavioral, physical, energetic, relational, and spiritual outcomes in all therapy modalities. And that sounds like an overstatement, but I really want you to listen to this podcast and understand the language and the themes in which Dr. Selvam is speaking, because we really dig into Dr. Selvam's work on the practice of embodying emotions. This is his book, which we reference frequently throughout this podcast, but we also talk about the shooting off points where we can actually get deeper into more modalities and how his practice of this integral somatic psychology is actually an adjunct to many therapeutic modalities. Dr. Selvam is a senior trainer in Dr. Peter Levine's Somatic Experiencing Professional Trauma Training Program. He has taught for 25 years in nearly as many countries in North and South Americas, Europe, Asia, Australia and the Middle East and the Far East. His work is informed by older body psychotherapy systems of Reikian therapy and bioenergetic analysis, newer body psychotherapy systems of body dynamic analysis and somatic experiencing and body work systems of postural integration and biodynamic craniosacral therapy. You will hear themes in this podcast that bridge into other episodes that I've had with previous guests and future guests. This truly was a phenomenal discussion about the way that we think about humaning and how we can interface that with the energy bodies and more work within the spiritual and psycho-emotional realms to infuse our well-being with information that comes from more than just the body. Dr. Selvam's full bio is in the show notes, and I hope that you really enjoy listening to this episode with this pillar of our community really supporting the therapeutic evolution of supporting the human condition and the soul's evolution. So thank you so much for agreeing to join me on the Unveiled podcast, Raja. I am so excited for this conversation because your book has really inspired me in many ways with my clients and just generally personally. And I can sense from it there's so much background and depth that we can get into. So I'm thrilled to have you here. And I kind of like to start for my listeners because I know lots about you and I will obviously put things in the show notes and people have listened to an introduction, but I really like to get my my um, guests to just introduce themselves and, and talk a little bit about the work that you do in the world and essentially how you serve. Thank you for the opportunity, Victoria. Uh, I, I can uh, have, I, 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 I expect to have a great uh, conversation with you today, yeah. Uh, my name is Raja Selvam, and uh, I was born in India, and I moved to the United States when I was 26 years old for further education. And uh, I, one thing led to another, and I eventually became a, a licensed clinical psychologist mm. in California. Now, what led to that uh, licensure is a, a journey that involved a great deal of personal healing that needed to be done, uh, uh, coming from a uh, history of a, a lot of trauma, going back to my birth in which my mother and, my, uh, mother and I nearly died. And, mm. uh, and, and uh, uh, the history of uh, se- early separations from my mother when she fell ill, you know, in which uh, I ended up feeling very abandoned. Uh, so these things, uh, you know, basically made it very difficult for me to uh, continue to be in my t- touch, continue to be in my touch, uh, continue to be in touch with the body, my emotions, etc. So I became a very you know, a heady person and uh, mental person, and it did me good in school, you know. Right. Um, and uh, but as I grew up and as I started to uh, go to university in India, then universities in the United States, and so on, uh, to pursue a career in business education, yeah? mm. I, I realized that there's something missing. Mm. Uh, there was a, a lack of uh, fulfillment in the relationship, uh, uh, inability to withstand uh, difficulties in, uh, in separation, mm. understandably. Mm-hmm. Uh, none of which I knew at the time had anything to do with my past. Mm. And uh, so this led to 
you know, self self exploration and therapy, and then one thing led to the other. Uh, right from the beginning, I became interested in uh, the, the emotion, mm. yeah, but I also became interested in the body, mm. Mm. and I also became interested in Jungian psychology because that's the closest psychology to Eastern psychology we have, mm -hmm. you know, with different levels of the psyche, mm. and um, I started to study body-oriented psychotherapy systems. Mm. Um, and then I, uh, I also started to specialize in working with trauma because I'd gone through severe trauma that involved a great deal of disembodiment and dissociation and so on. And, and so, so all these things really came together uh, in my developing the approach that, uh, that the book is about, um, the practice of embodying emotions. And, and uh, I'll give you a personal example. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that will just anchor the whole thing. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, my work is also my personal process as well as a professional process I engage mm -hmm. other people in. Mm -hmm. the, um, the other day, I was very disturbed. You know, I, I just worked with someone and I was quite disturbed. And uh, I woke up in the middle of the night uh, not feeling good, in fact, even feeling ill, thinking that I was actually ill, you know, mm, yeah. and uh, because I had a fever, mm -hmm. not, then I checked my fever, it was not a fever, I just, just felt like a fever, mm. and uh, I wondered if I was getting another bout of coronavirus, <laughs> but I, 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 but, you know, I couldn't sleep, so I started to hold my brain, for example, and that is one way to, um, expand and regulate the brain and through that expand and regulate the body mm. and the emotion in it so what started out as a disturbing experience in the body became more tolerable the moment i started to do that you know i just expanded the disturbing experience to more places in my body which would be contrary to uh, what most people might think of doing mm. It's to get rid of it, right? Mm -hmm. But as I did that, what happened? It became easier to be with it. It, mm -hmm. it was a way in which it's as though I was using my body, more of my body to hold the disturbance mm -hmm. rather than trying to confine it to one place and become more ill or mm -hmm. try to push it away, you know, which would be an, an avoidance. And then it became clear, you know, as I started to do that, it became clearer that it was a more defined emotion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a defined emotion of um, despair and um, helplessness. So once I noticed that, I also um, started to give it voice at some, somewhere along the line, uh, not aloud because my wife was sleeping next to me and I wanted to disturb her. Mm -hmm. But as I started to do that, then my body started to experience as though it were a small. Uh, and I knew from my pre previous therapy experiences that I was in the territory of regression. Mm. Yeah. And, and, and the moment I, I, I got a hold of that, then um, things just resolved. And uh, I also, you know, learned that uh, on a deeper level, I learned that uh, because of this early separation, I take any rejection in the world as a, uh, personal rejection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It could even be the computer refusing to cooperate with me, <laughs> loading slowly. Yes, why is yeah. it out to get me? <laughs> the world, the world. And then, you know, I couldn't have gotten there without actually willing to go deeper into the disturbance, vague disturbance mm -hmm. that is like an illness. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I started to go into that, then it became just a disturbance, it became, felt like despair and loneliness. And eventually it was the despair and loneliness of a child that felt reject, feels rejected every time anything animate, inanimate in the world, you know, doesn't go along mm -hmm. with its wish mm -hmm. in the moment, you know? Mm -hmm. So, and then all these different issues uh, of not my not uh, getting my needs met in this instance, everything poop, 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 disappeared like that. So it was a very significant uh, experience. Mm. And I thought that I would just begin there 
you know, mm. because in part because you work with functional medicine, you know, mm -hmm. you, you work with the psychological causes of illness, mm -hmm. chronic illness and so on. So, uh, so, so the whole idea there, uh, uh, you know, uh, is that is to expand the disturbing emotional experience, even if it's unspecified, even mm -hmm. if it's just feeling bad. Mm. And then expanding it to as much of the body as possible, which is resisting it through defenses. We form constrictions and other things. Mm -hmm. and, and using hands, but also using a verbal expression to non-verbally expand it in the body against mm -hmm. the resistance and so on. Then the, uh, what the science tells us is that uh, when the emotion is in the body, it becomes more tolerable especially when it's spread out more. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And as it spreads out more, and it can be, one can tolerate it more, be with the experience more, and that gives the brain plenty of time to process it, mm -hmm. you know, for meaning and, you know, alternatives, alternative action actions. Mm -hmm. no? mm -hmm. But, mm -hmm. but there's something inherently about having the emotion of the body and tolerating it that keeps the body open mm -hmm. for cognition and behavior that now science is telling us also depends on the body. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's a it's a complex science, you know. I put yeah. many findings there in a in a twisted sentence. But uh, the basically the idea is that when you have an emotion that's unpleasant or pleasant that you're trying to push away, please mm -hmm. don't embrace it and we have heard the term embrace it be with it right. but be with it in an active way yeah. expand it to as much of the brain and body as possible mm -hmm. you know using expression there are many tools to do that mm -hmm. uh, uh, and we'll talk about it later mm -hmm. and so it is something that people can do it's not a book that's written only for the therapist you know? right yeah. it's it's a book that's written for people all over the world mm -hmm. who who want who are looking for simple methods to help themselves and help others around them and i hope mm -hmm. that the practice of embodying emotions is able to uh, you know fill that need to a limited extent mm -hmm. uh, so. yeah and so the book we're talking about i have it sitting next to me it is the practice of embodying emotions and there's several things i want to say about this one we're not going to be able to cover even a fragment of this in today's podcast but you have just done a great job of giving us a synopsis in that example Two, this is a really brilliant read for normal people is what I say, normal people and practitioners. It's for the regular human, but also for um, people who are in clinical practice or in you know therapeutic practice. And the third thing is, this is just a fragment of your larger body of work, your larger teachings. So there's sure. so many layers here. And sure. just to double click on a couple of things that you just said, for me, as a as a human being, as well as a professional, the, there were two really key foundational things that really hit me as I was moving through this book. And the first was just the validation of the feeling anyhow stuff, you know, that kind of that mm, just just not just not quite mm, that's still a like I didn't even realize that I had emotions around it I was like hang on a second this feeling of meh is kind of like actually a thing and I was so taken with allowing that to exist in in my world to be an emotional experience and to really validate the kind of emotionality with it and the second element is what you've just spoken to and it is that hang on a second, why would I want more of the emotion? And that's not quite what we're saying. It's why do you want, why, it's how do you allow more of your body to be, be with the emotion as opposed to constricting and tightening against it. But you give so many wonderful examples within in your writing that really make this seem like a no brainer when you've kind of moved through the work. So I, I loved it from that perspective. Um, Lovely. I'm, I'm so glad to hear that you know, the book speaks well to you. Um, yeah, it, and it's a beautiful journey as well. And I, what I love about it is that you shared so much of yourself within it in terms of how you got to where you got to with this method. And I think that's the interesting thing for people because 
the therapeutic healing world, the therapeutic arts can feel like a bit of a wild west when we're just Googling for like somebody to help me. And I think we are all maybe at a, a place where we're going, do you know what? The, the talk therapy is, is something, but it's not enough. It's not going to get me across the line. It's there's something missing. And so the world of somatics or the world of this kind of like body oriented, whatever has exploded in recent kind of months, if not years, and yet there's still a little bit of, for me personally, and I, I this is a personal opinion, it's possibly not universal, but there's a lot of confusion, especially if you go to the internet kind of Instagram world of it. It's like everybody's using the word hashtag somatics as if they know what they're talking about. And I, mm-hmm. and I struggle with that because it's like people don't understand the science. And what I love from what you've done is you haven't just given us a, this is a nice theory about emotional embodiment or whatever. You've kind of given us the 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 science behind it which is a it's a feat of being able to convert this kind of slightly esoteric concept into being very practical and very neurobiologically based yeah 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 Yeah. it it it, um you know for science to uh or a psychotherapy method to uh spread us easily uh, or spread as easily uh, uh, as uh, broadcast news, it has to be simple. Yeah, yeah. It has to be simple, and uh, you know, God has given me the ability to simplify things. You know, mm-hmm. I, I, I'm interested in so many things. <laughs> I was telling my wife this morning, I'm so <laughs> bored all the time <laughs> that, uh, but that keeps me engaged. You know, I'm learning in different fields. Uh, all the time. I'm very interested. Mm -hmm. And I think that ability to synthesize all those uh, different streams of research, it comes naturally to me. I enjoy it. Yes. You know, and sometimes it does feel like giving birth, even though I've not given birth, Mm -hmm. uh, to bring all of it together and to really bring it together in a simple way. It's, I realized when writing the book, it's not as easy as I thought it was. You know, I can talk, <laughs> but to put yes. it down in writing is a lot harder. And I'm glad that I was able to do that. And um, absolutely, yeah. yes. And I and I know several people who've read your book and actually felt like, just even from the introduction, that there is a kind of like, oh, I get the journey. You've done a really great job of telling the story as well as you know giving the practical side of it. And great. you know your integral somatic psychology like the clues in the name integral like there's an integrated nature of it so give us a little bit of a flavor of of that if you would like so what comes under your integral somatic psychology define some of the terms if you want to from your perspective because obviously again like i've just said somatics is being used like anything these days so feel for free me to sort the, of... yeah the the entire uh, project is about emotional um, embodiment yeah and uh, uh, by which i mean expanding the emotional experience to as much of the body as possible mm-hmm. to create a, create a greater capacity to tolerate it, to be with it, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, that's just a tool. Yes. Uh-huh. That's not a, uh, that's not, so why would anyone want to do that? <laughs> yes, right. And it's not, a, it's not a lifestyle that we're prescribing that people do it at every moment, like people are aware of their posture in every moment. That's not what we're saying. Okay. Uh, what we're saying is that, when people have difficulties uh, in therapy or in life, uh, perhaps at times it's the lack of emotion, uh, emotion and its embodiment that that can be a, a great key to unlocking different things. So mm-hmm. the the model of the psyche, you know, uh, that is um, touched upon in the book is the model where uh, we can we are nothing more than our body what is called the gross body in the East, the physical body in the West. Yeah. It's the body that we're born with and the body that goes into the coffin or earth, you know, depending on a religious uh, persuasion. Mm-hmm. Uh, science, Western science by and large, in psychology as well as in, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, other realms, uh, we believe, we believe um, even against evidence that this is the only source of all of our experiences, mm-hmm. that all of our cognitions 
behaviors, emotions, our awareness, language, even the awareness of all these things mm-hmm. are a product of what are, what are called uh, are, uh, emergent properties of the body and the brain. Yeah. Right? So we, we, it's like a light bulb that's turned on. And it's almost like a light bulb that develops. It's turned on. It, it's able to illuminate itself in the world. And mm-hmm. then when it dies, it just, you know, it, it fuses blown, something like that. Mm-hmm. So if we look at the uh, science uh, laid out in the book, it's only at that level, mm. right? This body. Yeah. However, however, I also touch upon other things. Mm-hmm. That we are not only this body, right? Um, all the religions say that we are not just this body. Mm-hmm. There's a body that you know goes on someplace, you know, to a permanent place or a, a recycling center. You know? <laughs> yes. So, so there is that body, and there is there's research in outer body experiences and, and near death experiences done by reputable psychiatrists. You know. Um, uh, research on memories of people uh, from uh, from death to rebirth, and a great deal of scientific evidence these days on reincarnation at the University of Virginia. Uh, uh, you know, and and um, so all of this tells us that there is another body, right? But and then in the world there there is the energy psychology modality that tells us, you know, hey, there is a our body does not depend only on food and water. It also depends on the energy of the universe. Right? Mm-hmm. Now, there are other energy psychology models that say, even be- be- between this physical body and the vast universe that in, in, on which it, it depends intimately, we cannot live without it. There is another body, you know, the soul, mm-hmm. and uh, called the subtle body in the East that mm-hmm. exists only at the subatomic level. Mm-hmm. And the reason why I talk about these levels is because our emotion, cognition, and behavior, we know scientifically, depends not only on this brain and this body, but also on the environment. Mm-hmm. It also depends on the environment. And uh, not just psychologically, actually physically, physiologically. Mm-hmm. And so my question became, how do you we, in fact, Candice Pert, a great uh, researcher, a molecular biologist, who wrote mm-hmm. a great book called The Molecules, Molecules of Emotion. Emotion. Yeah. The emotions come, they seem to appear to come sometimes from the brain, mm-hmm. sometimes from the body, mm-hmm. sometimes from outside of the body, mm-hmm. when it seems to be manifesting at the cellular level at the same time in the brain and the body. This is based on scientific research. Yeah. So how do we then you know, when we work with emotions, is there something there that we can work with either to gather resources mm-hmm. or to work with difficulties with emotions that originate there so that our the practice of embodying emotions in this body, we are only, only concerned about this body, right? Mm-hmm. That they say we acquire in every life to perfect the soul. We need, it's like an alchemical container. Mm-hmm. So that led me to look for a more integrated model of the psyche that involves the subtle body of the individual that exists only at the uh, at subatomic level, the gross body of the individual that exists at the sub- subatomic level and supraatomic level, subatomic level, mm-hmm. and then and then the larger collective that consists of lower level archetypes like elements mm-hmm. and the higher level archetypes of you know primordial energies. Mm-hmm. So can we? When we work with emotion, mm. can we also connect to these bodies or work with these bodies to make the project of emotional embodiment a lot easier? Uh, mm-hmm. That is where uh, this whole thing came, uh, mm-hmm. the term integral, that involves, uh, you know, not only integrates cognition, emotional behavior yeah. on a micro level, but it in- involves, you know, the individual, different bodies, of the individual, different levels of the body with the individual and the collective body, and bringing it all together. Mm-hmm. That is the that is how the I, the, the model of integral somatic, somatic psychology was developed. Mm-hmm. 
So, and that's beautiful. I mean, I I almost want everyone to rewind a few minutes and listen to all of that again, because what I really value about professionals like yourself is that ability to see beyond just a discipline that is the thing that I'm doing in this practical moment of whether it's somatic experiencing or whether it's, you know, I don't know, emotional release technique or whatever it is. It's like these all silo things into being of this world. And I mm. began with the Eastern mysticism. In fact, one of the first books in this realm I ever met read was Candice Pert's Molecules of Emotion, which is okay. an old book now. It's it's yeah, not this yeah. is not a recent book. Um mm. And there's so much in this where I was very happy to just sign up for the spiritual side. Of it. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I'll take that philosophy. But science really needs that proven element. We need to we need to identify it on the molecular level, on the you know electromagnetic level, whatever the level is that we're going to identify some of these shifts, etc. And then it needs to be brought into for want of better words, clinical practice. So, okay, this is the theory of how it all works, but how do we then work with this to facilitate effectively healing, transformation, um, you know, the evolution of the soul, if that's what we're doing? It needs to be concrete. My training is 12 days, right? I have uh, no idea. Wow, okay. (laughs) 12 days, three, four-day modules. So I used to teach it over 24 days. Now it's only three, four-day modules which means that a lot is packed into it. Mm. Uh, the book is only half the story. Right. right? I got that I'll sense, it, actually. I was like, you were dropping hints of like, there's more here. In the <laughs> end. Like, in, in, in the, yeah, in the end. So, for example, uh, and the models have to be very simple, right? So Because you have to talk, to talk about them in the morning, demonstrate it in the afternoon, and people have to <laughs> practice in the evening, right? It's all <laughs> over that's why it's simple because you want to get it into 12 days yeah. and you absolutely and, and, right. Okay. And, 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 and the training is all about suffering, right? So I say, let's do the hard work here so we can enjoy our life out there. <laughs> and I'll, I'll give an example. Now. I worked with a woman. This is a couple of days ago. And the woman had a great deal of emotion. And uh, she could even... Uh, a, a great deal of dysregulation, right. you know, complex trauma. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we would expand the sphere in the body or grief in the body, I forget which emotion. Mm-hmm. But then something happened and she would recycle all over again. Uh-huh. Right? Usually when you embody an emotion, mm-hmm. uh, usually the cognition improves, behavior improves, capacity to be with the emotion improves. Oh. Things resolve. Mm-hmm. But for her, it, it flipped into something. Mm-hmm. And I was noticing it. Then I realized she was stuck. The, the, she was stuck in a pattern. Mm-hmm. And she could embody the emotion. You know, and she was really sincere. But somewhere along the line, something came in. And some, the, some, that something is victimhood. Mm-hmm. You know, that, you know, it's a poor me, you know. Yeah, it's it's a child came and the child ego took over, and that's yeah. not uncommon when we suffer a lot, yeah. and we grow up, uh, we go to therapy, and of course, therapists were well-meaning, bring us a great deal of compassion. Right. Now that could be easily, uh, you know, imprinted as a great deal of pity, self-pity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the problem is that then it regresses the person, and the person is not able to handle what is going on. You know, there's a more dysregulation, more emotion, and so on. So I said, we need to shift it. Let's see, let's do this. You know, there's an archetype element that can be accessed through the sacred center in the body. I'm talking about the subtle body. Mm-hmm. The, it's you know, it's uh, called the water element, mm-hmm. and this element you can access it, you know, uh, through the sacral chakra, or you can work with the zones in the body. I'm using a therapy called polarity, mm-hmm. the very basis of it. And you can work with those zones and connect the zones and increase the supply of the water element in the body, right? Mm-hmm. In the subtle body and then through that in the gross body. Yeah. This has the ability to do different things. It can take us deeper, but it can also dissolve rigidities at the level of the subtle body and gross body. Mm. Repeated patterns. 
And as soon as they started to do that, she got into another space altogether. Mm. Right? Mm. She came into a strength. She was no longer stuck in the pattern of victimhood. Mm-hmm. And then she could acknowledge her strength that mm-hmm. the, the, the regression, repeated regression was undermining. Mm. Mm-hmm. So we go to the, uh, we call it the basic archetypal element of water. You know, it's a low level, you know, the collective psyche is thought of as having archetypes. No? Mm-hmm. There are lower level archetypes and higher level archetypes, energy mm-hmm. patterns. Mm-hmm. Um, we are actually a combination of these patterns, mm-hmm. according to Jungian psychology. Yeah. So we pull, pull on the archetypal pattern to access its qualities to then transform the experience in the gross body. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Another, another love example. Of, yeah. I was just going to say what I love about that is you're not going, oh, there's this pattern of victimhood that showed up. Let's talk about it. (laughs) You're going into the elemental architecture of the subtle body behind the manifestation in form. Yeah. yeah. Clearly, the person was serious and sincere, hardworking person. And she didn't quite, she couldn't quite see that uh, it from uh, that the unconscious was tripping her at the very you know, it's almost like, uh, you know, it's just at the finish line and then somebody trips you. <laughs> and you yeah. don't know who tripped you. You look around, you know, who tripped you. Yeah. So somebody else has to see it, right? And yeah. another example of a person mm-hmm. who was in a great deal of overwhelm, I remember him now, where he's from, etc. And it's so many stresses, <laughs> right? Complete overwhelm. Mm. And uh, so we worked with all that. And then we worked with the fire element, right? And it completely brought him out of her, you know? So when you access these levels, you also access possibilities that are not possible just on the physical level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he became more empowered. He could, not that his difficulties externally have shifted, Mm -hmm. but he was, he felt more able he came into an emotional state Mm -hmm. so we are accessing emotions right Uh, through elements he came into the emotion of power so he could see yeah these things have always been there but i'm more capable of coping with them and Mm -hmm. that is a good resolution so we need Mm -hmm. to bring so sometimes we have to go beyond this body yeah to another body or to the collective body Mm. to gather intelligence and materials to resolve the emotional problem in the present. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, like if we anyone... go to each other to get emotional support. Right, we yeah, go exactly. to the, the human connection, yeah. yeah. If anyone yeah. wants a listening partner to this podcast, a few episodes back, I interviewed Stephen Kessler. And I went into that interview expecting it to be all about personality patterns and stuff like that and actually he was saying very similar things to what you're sharing with me today about the energy work and the movement of energy in a in a more kind of like ethereal plane that's not in matter affecting directly this resolution and what I love Mm -hmm. about that is that um the trajectories for both of you to get there have been different and yeah, yeah. the scientific immersion from both of you has been equal in different areas. And then brilliant minds arrive at the same place, which is that we're not just existing in this 3D, yeah. 4D plane yeah. of existence. And you can't have therapeutic tools which only apply to it. Or it, I, I, if you can, it takes forever. <laughs> or Well, it's, it's like, uh, you know, trying to do something complex with your hands with one hand tied behind your back. Mm-hmm. Yes, because but, we're not using just all as- of us. Yeah, exactly. Not using all of us. When we, when we uh, know that there is more of us, it's easier to deal with reality on any level of it. So. Yes. Yeah, because we feel like um, even me just sitting here having this conversation with you, you know, I feel more expansive just listening to you talk and I'm kind of feeling into, oh yeah, there's that. I started in this world of like looking at the astral bodies and the, all the, all of the seven subtle bodies and all the things. And I forget about it because this world becomes very dense and we dense. become very caught up with things. And I, I love people who remind me that there is more to, to every single one of us. And there is Definitely. more access points. There's more ways in to the yeah. system. Yeah. Now, the science is telling us that if we only care to uh, 
look at look at look at it. You know, for example, just a couple of days ago, I read an article on quantum physics. Mm -hmm. So the evidence is increasing that the world is a hologram. Mm -hmm. Right. So any every small small part of the universe, no matter how small, the universe is reflected in its mm -hmm. entirety. Mm -hmm. You know, this we have known from spiritual, uh, in, in a path, in yeah. a ancient uh, yeah, yeah. spiritual path. But now science is coming there. Science is coming there. Right, right. And it's, in my head, it's a shame that science needs to prove it. Um, but, you know, people are who they are. And we kind of need to have all of the the, the evidence to, to back up yeah. some of these things sometimes. And there's a resistance, uh, you know, the... Uh, even a simple energy psychology method like thought field therapy and emotional freedom technique yep. that really actually taps along certain meridians, a technique that's so easy to learn. Okay. It's so easy to learn that you think it's a hoax yes. if you do not try it. And, uh, and, and, uh, and um, it, is, it has been approved by the American Psychological Association for psychologists they're continuing education requirements to keep their licensure. You know, mm -hmm. they have to get 36 hours every two years mm -hmm. since 2012. Right. And they had to start submit in excess of 30, you know, randomized control studies. Yeah. 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 And, 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 and uh, usually evidence-based means five studies that are credible. <laughs> but because of the resistance to mm -hmm. the invisible mm -hmm. layers of reality that we don't commonly perceive, mm -hmm. um, you know, it took them a long time. I'm glad they did that. Mm. I'm glad yes. they did that. So yeah. psychology can improve a great deal. You know, we're talking about sensing this body, sensing body sensations. They go, wow, that is improving outcomes and shortening treatment times by far. Yeah, true. You know, it's very simple, right? Mm -hmm. So, and then, uh, you know, I, I, what I'm I'm saying is that, you know, hey, bring in emotion, embody emotion. You know, it's not just about striking body sensation. Yeah. That can even improve outcomes further. And that mm -hmm. is also there. Can, you can predict it a priori from just the theoretical out, uh, evidence out there. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't even have to run uh, a posteriori, you know, posteriori. Uh, tests of yeah. the method with another method it, it, you can't it, you don't have to uh, yeah. uh, you, you can see that but if you bring in this other realms of who we are into the mix mm -hmm. the outcomes can only be better you know mm -hmm. so. yeah certainly and i think that when it comes to looking at all of these things and and it's it's worth us get putting the effort in to get these things into more mainstream but i can't i can't believe it takes this long you know from I, i've said this several times on the podcast it's like the ancient chinese had it right why did we bother doing anything yeah, <laughs> it's like yeah. their meridian systems their you know points of like contact i mean my mum was a started in like health kinesiology applied kinesiology so we were tapping from when i was like i don't know 13 and we were doing like holding points when we had headaches and all those sorts of things oh, wow, and it, wow, wow. it works but i mean we wouldn't have like done it if it didn't work and energy toning movements and all the things just rubbing along the meridian so you kind of yeah. And all of that is in me somewhere, but I did exactly the same thing. I went, oh, okay, that's a bit weird. I need to go full force into like medicine. <laughs> so give me the medical side of things. And it's so interesting. And I'd like to move to that slightly now, if we can, and talk about Please. this kind of health Please. side of things, because I find this fascinating. And we touched on it lightly in our earlier conversation before we recorded this in terms of, and you mentioned it right at the beginning. It's like, we are going around bankrupting healthcare systems, diagnosing millions and millions of chronic diseases, fictionalizing diagnoses that I'm not even sure what they are. They're just syndromes with collections of symptoms. And I'm really interested in the kind of holistic underpinnings of all of this and also how we move forward as a, a yeah. set of societies and treating it. And I'd love you just to speak about your experience or examples or anything you feel about this kind of the illness epidemics and the relationship to the work that you do and, and this kind of integration of all these modalities and how you see it fitting. Yeah, I'm going to do that, but I'm going to turn the light on to get, get me some more light here. Uh, amazing. It, it's getting dark here. <laughs> yes, where are you actually? You're in you're in Germany. You're in Cologne, Germany, aren't you? Germany. 
late there. So, so um, you know, the psychosomatic or what is now known as psychophysiologic uh, symptom literature uh, shows that from anywhere from 25% to one third of the symptoms, medical symptoms that uh, people take to their primary care physicians, medical doctors is psychophysiological or psychosomatic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, they've actually set up a, a psychophysiologic disorders association in, in New York. Uh, mm -hmm. Medical doctors have set it up. Now, how does that come about? How, how does that come about? There are many reasons, right? There, there can be environmental reasons, genetic reasons, and so on. But very often, um, it seems to arise from an inability to tolerate the emotional stresses of life. Mm. Yeah. And uh, uh, let's look, look at it a bit deeply. Now, for example, I'll give you an example. Uh, yeah. for the, so I have grief. And it's an intolerable emotion. It's an unpleasant emotion, right? By its very nature, it's a state of stress, stress and dysregulation in, of the body. If it were not, grief would feel like cakewalk. <laughs> right? What makes an emotion feel bad is how, the, the, how it stresses and dysregulates the physiology to generate that emotion. Yeah. And um, so, so what do I do? I, I don't, the brain is innately against unpleasant emotional experiences mm -hmm. because it's taking the organism toward less well-being, mm -hmm. right? So there's an innate resistance in all of us to right. avoid pain. You know, I don't want to get a jab, you know, uh, at a doctor's office for that mm -hmm. reason. So mm -hmm. why would I want to feel jab here from grief or fear? Right. So I try to minimize it physically, psychologically. Oh, or uh, I say, oh, this, I shouldn't feel grief. Only uh, <clears throat> losers feel grief and so on. Sad. Uh, psychologically, I might, uh, why should I feel sad? I'm one with the universe. You know, I use spirituality to <laughs> not feel grief. Yes. Yeah. Or I I try to um, uh, repress it. Uh, or I, I, I say, let me read a good book. Mm -hmm. Cognitively get rid of it. Yeah. Or let me watch a movie. Behaviorally to get out of it. Yeah. So, but very often, right from the beginning, we form what are called psycho uh, physiological defenses, like mm -hmm. uh, like um, like uh, constriction defense is a common one. That's not yeah. the only defense. So, yeah. uh, in osteopathy, we know that we can form constriction of the diaphragm here. So, mm -hmm. so I don't want to feel that. So I tighten the diaphragm. Mm -hmm. But I learned it as a child to reduce my breath, not to have too much oxygen for my emotion. Mm -hmm. What am I doing? I'm, I'm blocking, this constriction will block my breath, but also it will block blood flow between the chest and the abdomen mm -hmm. to some extent, nervous system communication, because the mm -hmm. nerves are all going a lot through that. And, uh, you know, lymphatic flows. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and also interstitial flows, what yeah. Candice Bird talked about, you know, yeah. intercellular flows that carry nutrients around. Yeah. But it also tightens the fascia and so on, so it blocks the electromagnetic flows. Mm -hmm. But it also blocks the quantum flows. Mm -hmm. of so we are setting it up by constricting against the grief. <clears throat> Here, also in the organs of the... Uh, chest and the lungs, what am I doing? I'm actually increasing the level of dysregulation mm -hmm. by decreasing the six or seven flows that are known to be vital for a self-regulation. Yeah. You see that? And if I do too much of it, what happens? I get asthma symptoms. Mm -hmm. That is psychophysiological in nature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I worked with a woman. I'll, I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. Who felt, I, I talk about it in the book, who mm. got an asthma back. She used to have asthma as a child. Mm -hmm. Grew up, she didn't have it. 
but uh, she um, has had it for a year, she said, in a class. And I said, what happened a year ago? She said, nothing. I said, <laughs> tell me, did your relationship change? Did your work change? Said, oh, yeah, really? I gave up a relationship. And I said, uh, tell me about the relationship. Well, you know, this relationship was the most uh, loving in my life, of my life. I, 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 I uh, could have been love of my life, but I gave it up because he was beginning to disappoint me. And I said, have, have you felt any feelings around it? She said, no, because I, I made the decision and I'd already processed it, processed it leading to the uh, point where I told him that I wanted to, um, um, you know, uh, break up. So I didn't feel it. I said, uh, you know, <laughs> is, is there by any coincidence that the symptom came after? She said, yeah, might have come up, you know, might have come up after it. And she's a psychotherapist. No? <laughs> so, so I said, then I said, I had a talk, think about the love that she felt toward him to open her up. And then I said about, had him watch him walk away into the distance, like in a movie, disappearing into the horizon. Mm -hmm. And see, I said, isn't it sad? And she said, yeah, maybe. And where do you feel it? I feel it in my eyes a little bit. Maybe a little bit in my throat, maybe a little bit here. Mm -hmm. Very super. And then I had to do vocalization and all that. The, to cut the long story short, it was like pulling teeth. <laughs> and neither of us knew, you know, you know, we had an agreement actually, both of us, that not, nothing might have happened. Right. But it surprised me. Mm. That opened the door. She said that she went home and cried. And then she did not have an asthma attack after that. You know, uh, she met me in the next training six months later. So people are forming big symptoms. You would say asthma is a big symptom. Right, sure. Or uh, I can think of cardiovascular symptoms like arrhythmia and, yeah. and, and blood pressure. These mm -hmm. serious symptoms people are forming by repressing their emotions and disembodying them. You know, uh, you know, even at very low levels of emotion and intensity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, which is bad because it's widespread, and therefore people are getting addicted to things. So, if a doctor gives you, you know, uh, oxycodone, mm -hmm. of course you're going to go for it. <laughs> yeah. Right. And uh, and 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 so the uh, pharmaceutical industry is a culprit there. No? They've been found liable and so on. Mm -hmm. the Sackler family. But um, so it's easy. It's easy to push it away. Mm. And then, but when we do that, we pay a very heavy price for it, physical health symptoms, mm -hmm. but also the body cannot be open in a genuine way to the pleasures of life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have to, you know, we have to work the body for pleasure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Eat or... Uh, you know, play or as opposed to having a spontaneous pleasure that's also part of a birthright. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. So and this is and this all of that speaks to why, even though I ended up in functional medicine, I was never really doing functional medicine because it was so obvious to me, I think because of the history that I had before it. I was I would get a lot of arrhythmia patients for some unknown reason. I had a lot of people with atrial fibrillation, yeah. none of which not genetically oriented, not that not, and I'm like well, I'm they'd a, been gone, they'd been gone through the medical mill, right? Other, right? They will not come to us, right? I mean, when you when I have a serious symptom, I will not come to you. I'll go to no. the medical doctor right. first. Right, doctor so. first, white coat first, yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and 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 then realizing that treating people with a green pharmacy is what I used to call it. So just throwing supplements at the situation wasn't the right thing. Like I recognized very early on that pe the people that were showing up with these chronic illnesses were basically showing up with some form of chronic dysregulation, mostly chronic dysregulation coupled with suppression of something, something so, historic. And yeah. so that's when I began thinking, well, how do I help them on that level? And that's kind of when I ended up looking at, coaching and somatic experiencing and all those Wonderful. kinds of things because Wonderful. it's like you need the holistic toolkit and currently where I'm yeah. sitting now in, in the position that I have um running a big medical arm of a wellness center here in Austin 
we have very intentionally set that the more kind of not necessarily energy work, but that the coaching, the softer skills side of it is front and center with a medical bit on the side. And that's almost throwing everything on its head, even though we have ketamine assisted therapy and we do all of that kind of fancy bells and whistle stuff because I'm there, I'm going, no, no, the, the human like multi-layered existence bit needs to be at the center and everything else can complement that because it's the only way to truly transform people. Yeah. 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 And I benefit from work, your kind of work in all of that. Like I just um, absorb all of it. And the thing about books like yours and work like yours is it's a resonant felt truth. When you say it and you describe it, something in our nervous system goes, yeah, that feels right. As opposed to you've got this random heart issue, have some statins and some, I don't know, you know, blood thinners. (laughs) I know, I know, I know. Now, uh, to say a little more, while we were talking, what came into my mind is this issue of, again, these psychophysiological symptoms. Mm-hmm, yes. Right? Uh, they're not psycho- psychosomatic terminology has been thrown out because it started to mean that people are making it all Making up. it up. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. But there is the body is definitely involved. And um, I just wrote a paper for a UK magazine, osteopathic magazine. Mm-hmm. You know, body workers, uh, uh, people go to when they have a symptom uh, like my fibromyalgia, chronic mm-hmm. fatigue, and uh, uh, they don't often go to psychotherapists. Yeah. And there, there's a reason for that. And the reason can be found in the, uh, the research on psychophysiological symptoms uh, in the psycho- uh, psychology literature. Mm. What we find is that people who form psychophysiological symptoms tend to have a lot of early trauma. Mm-hmm. Right? In combination, in combination with the lack of uh, capacity for emotion. Mm-hmm. You know, to access emotion, to be with emotion, to tolerate emotion, to express emotion, all of these things that have mm-hmm. to do with mm-hmm. emotional capacity. And the ACE study, the Adverse uh, adverse Childhood Experiences study, Mm -hmm. uh, also confirms that there's a longitudinal study that Mm -hmm. it's a uh, study of correlations. Mm -hmm. People who have had a lot of trauma, people who also have difficulty with emotion, tend to form very serious illnesses later, more than others who don't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and, um, so, but then how do you get them? You know, there are people who come to us, right? Uh, they made the difficult step of uh, come to uh, uh, will come to us, and we understand that. But there are body workers who keep working with their bodies, and they're getting frustrated because either the symptom comes back or it another symptom appears. Yeah. And these very people, when suggest when uh, they su- it is suggested to them that perhaps a little bit of psychological work might be in order. They resist. Yeah. They also have lack psychological insight. So the question was that, excuse me, the question was asked, how do you get them to also consider psychological work? Right. Mm-hmm. And I thought about it and I said, you can do this. So do the following. Um, it's one of those techniques that I talk about in the book. Mm-hmm. Have them sense the pain, right? In the symptom, mm. in the body. Mm-hmm. So if it's chronic pain in a certain place, have them sense the pain. Mm-hmm. See if they can spread it. This is radical, right? But even if they did not, what 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 you do need to do is to have them bring it into their face as an expression and a vocalization as an expression. Mm-hmm. So I might go, I, my stomach is hurting. And they go, uh, uh, uh. You see that? Mm-hmm. I start to do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and you mirror that. Mm-hmm. And sooner or later, if it's psychophysiological nature and if it's the emotion is the cause of it, the emotional tone comes into the throat and voice, face. Mm-hmm. Because 
the face and throat physiology have a particular specialization to decode yeah. the, the incoherent emotional experience in the body. Yeah. And that's what research shows us. When you, if you bring emotion in the brain to the face and throat, all from the body to the face and throat, the brain centers that process emotion and their associations are lighting up more than when they're not. Right. This is fascinating, right? Yes, this is science. Fascinating. Yeah, this is great. Yeah. Yeah. And then you go, then they become aware that they have an emotion there in the symptom. Right. And then you say, hey, I don't work with this. Can I refer you to my colleague so that we can work with you as a team? And this yes. is how you, you know, get the reluctant people to, yeah. uh, without much insight to the psychological realm to help them yeah. further so that they're not going from, one energy work, body work, uh, medical uh, practice to another, uh, yeah. for, you, know, the, you know, spending a lot of time and money, you know, yeah. and suffering regardless. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And that's why I've always been, firstly, that's a ninja technique, which I hope everyone who's listening to this, who is in practice and especially body workers, like take note, um, because that's brilliant. But this is why I'm passionate about education. So education that people know what else is out there. People know where their scope of practice is and where it ends. And that's mm. so important. And it's what we don't do because, you know, Western world is ego centered and we're all kind of like, oh, I can fix anyone. anyone this is not yeah. every practitioner, so. but this is some of the practitioners. And it's like, I've always been fastidious about working in teams, teams like I may have like yeah. my functional medicine hat on right now, but I've got my chiropractor, I've got my osteopath, I've got my, you know, my somatic experiencing practitioner, I've got my energy worker, I've got, that's my suite of people who I can refer out to because my job, I always viewed my job as like decoding where the problem starts and do they need a little bit of like supplemental support so I can, yeah. so they feel a little different then they ferry through the circle of people. Um, but I never had that skill, <laughs> like how to convince the resistant people. <laughs> so I just hit them with reason, like this is what happened in your life and therefore maybe this, but I think- I mean, I'm explaining all these things like physiological flows get blocked, emotions that they go, what does it have to do with me? Right. right. I have a problem, you know? Yeah. I have no. a chronic fatigue. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yes, I've, yeah, got, so. I've got a proper diagnosis. <laughs> so, <laughs> like, no, I love this. And what I love about it is that there's this ease of kind of understanding when you have just curiosity and the desire to heal. But what we're describing is people who have a resistance pattern that's manifested as an illness. So the resistance to the go and see the psychotherapist is part of the illness itself. It's exactly. within the resistance pattern. Exactly. So I love that that kind of brings it to the forefront without it feeling like just yelling at the patient saying, no, you have to do this or, you know, the, the label of psychosomatic. I, it's so true. Like GPs in the UK, so general practitioners or you know, whatever we call them everywhere else would just sort of say about something like IBS. Oh, it's all stress. And technically that may have an element of truth to it, yeah, yeah, but the it way it's given that. is yeah. so judgmental. So, so yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. They kind of, mm. yeah. Yeah. Go on. No, I was just going to say, so within all of this, where do you find yourself working at this moment in time? Are you working directly with patients? Are you training? Are you, what's your kind of spread of works? My life is these days is training, training, training. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And supervision, supervision, supervision. Right. Yes. And uh, and we have, we have students all over the world. And um, uh, I work with people only in the context of trainings as demonstrations. Demos. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't have a private practice. I don't do individual sessions. I don't mm -hmm. have the time. Right. Uh, nor do I do individual uh, uh, supervision. I have a monthly, you know, um, Supervision, so I call case, I call case consultations, consultations for people all over the, from people all over the world. You know, like it's very interesting to find people from Japan and Korea and, <laughs> and the United States, uh, you know, Israel and South Africa, all in the same group. And um, so, so I'm I, I'm busy, but I'm training people. You know, yeah. I'm training for people. For example, I have a pan European, uh, you know, uh, training starting in November. Uh, a pan Asian Pacific region uh, uh, in a training uh, starting mm -hmm. in, at the end of this month. Mm -hmm. So where people are coming from different countries. Mm -hmm. uh, these, these 
I think the pandemic has made it possible. Yeah. And uh, so once the pandemic is over, then we will start to do local trainings so with local translations. But for now, it's there. Mm-hmm. And uh, and uh, so that's what I'm busy with these days. Mm-hmm. You know, so, yeah. And I'm fascinated by people who do global stuff, especially in this realm. I'm interested in how the cultural differences affect what you do. Do you find any difference or are we just on a innate human level? Because I, I'm pretty sure that different cultures have a different relationship with the experience and yeah. expression of emotion. So you almost, they your do. work must vary. They do. But um, given that people do have emotions, <laughs> the universal People do have truth. emotional expressions, right? <laughs> yes. So then you work with them. You you work in that context uh, to to start to work with whatever emotions they have, mm-hmm. whatever expression they have, to embody those emotions, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and not worry about, not try to bring in, uh, you know, the Western idea to it right. or an Indian idea to it. Sure, you know. Sure. Uh, People feel bad. Mm. People felt good all over the world, right? People feel overwhelmed. Mm-hmm. People find feel at ease mm-hmm. all over the world. These are kind of universal universal emotional states, mm-hmm. and it is at that level that difficulty also arises. Mm. We feel bad or overwhelmed, therefore we shut our body down, and in the process, brain down, and the process we lose access to more finer more uh, finer emotions but also more sophisticated thinking and behavior mm, mm-hmm. that's what happens mm-hmm. so i'm happy to just work with you're feeling bad okay that's serious yeah. let's embody that mm-hmm. let's mm-hmm. see whether we can develop a capacity for that the other day a person said i don't feel anything i just feel overwhelmed i said does it feel good or bad what do you think she asked i said bad i imagine she said yeah and it feels bad. It's overwhelming, right? So let's spread the overwhelm. Let's mm-hmm. grasp, grapple with how bad it feels. Mm-hmm. Then slowly, as she started to expand it, then she said, hey, I'm breathing better. It doesn't feel as bad. And is there a hint of sadness there? <laughs> so it started to differentiate, you know, into yeah. more, um, you know, people feel sad, people feel happy, people, you know, throughout mm-hmm. the world. You know, mm-hmm. So we, mm-hmm. uh, and of course, there are infinite number of emotions we're capable of, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and uh, especially at the sensory motor level. Yeah, you know the way we describe our bodily states meaningfully in relation to uh, what's happening to us. Yes, you know. Yeah, and I think uh, anyone who's listening to this who's kind of thinking, "Do I feel emotions? Do I not?" Reading Raj's book and understanding this sensory motor level of making sense of the sensor, it's honestly helped me massively I was actually I took it on a walk and sat in the middle of the ground in the UK I was in the UK when I was reading this in a field and kind of got lost in your book and was like oh the sun's now set and I need to get back to my house it's a really good primer on allowing you to contact some of these sensory motor things because it, it is a really good way to get into it because if you feel like we, I don't here, feel you know, people feel like a failure I don't have emotions my therapist says that I don't have emotions right you know, when in fact I went to my therapist desperate, that's an emotion, feeling really bad, that's an emotion, <laughs> feeling really overwhelmed, that's an emotion. Yes. Let's yeah. start with that, you know. I know. And I love that because I was like, I don't feel like, like, like my coach was trying to get me to like anger uh, w- with reason. And I was like, I don't, I don't feel it. I just feel confused and I feel lost and I feel kind of like frustrated. And then I read your book. I was like, I'm feeling things. Feeling things, exactly. <laughs> yes, it's awesome. But yes, yeah, and I and I feel like there's it makes sense when you're talking about the cross-cultural thing. It's like I'm sure this work is more impactful in cultures where it's inbuilt into the the upbringing that you repress emotions especially brits you know don't feel anything don't admit you feel anything <laughs> you know it's just like repression is in our dna <laughs> yeah yeah but that's not uh, that's the you know it's it's uh, at the same time the uh, the people in britain have a very exquisite um you know uh, emotional uh, life it's like uh, I would say it's delicate and exquisite, like a French pastry. I would say, <laughs> yeah, I yeah, they, they have it. They, I mean, it's it's not that they don't. It's true right. that they they they're stoic, and um, 
uh, you know, they tend to bear things. And yeah. uh, but it's not that they lack emotion. They do no. have emotion. We cannot, you know, emotion tells us consciously, unconsciously, uh, how the world is affecting us, mm-hmm. our well-being. Mm-hmm. There's no way we cannot have an emotion, at least at an unconscious level. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, actually, there's no feedback. Right. There's no actual metric. There's no, you know, yeah, yeah. marker. And and your book is great in in explaining, you know, what is emotion and, and tying all this cognition, behavior, and emotion stuff together. It's a really great read. So I hope yeah. I've convinced people to go buy and read it. <laughs> during Lovely. This. Thank you. Thank you. You know, you know, and it'll be out in a number of languages next year. Not amazing. Just, it's going to be out in eight other languages next year, oh, other than English. So great. And and um, it's um, I, I lost the train of thought here, but um, yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll just let you lead with the next question. For sure. No, I I have just a couple more questions. The one thing is, I really would love to understand what drives you personally in all of this. What's underlying all of this for you? Is it changing the world? Is it improving one person at a time? What's the underlying mission in your kind of being? I feel extremely satisfied with what I do. Mm. And uh, uh, I think that's the motivation. Yeah. Uh, that it's extremely fulfilling. You know, mm-hmm. my wife is amazed at how I will go into a training feeling not so good and come out of the training four days later feeling great. Mm. And she used to do this. You know, you've done four days of work. Why don't you take a day off? And I say, do I feel like a person who needs to take a day off? Right. You know, I have so much energy coming out mm-hmm. of the training, then going mm-hmm. in. Mm. So I think that, I think my, uh, somehow uh, I'm living out my purpose. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah. That's how I see it. No? And, I love um, that. Yeah, and, and uh, I see the need for it, mm. what I do, uh, as profoundly, personally transform- transformative. So I can, given my history, given what I need to heal, Mm -hmm. this process, in a way, is giving me the path to heal. Mm. When I work on myself, when I work with others as well, you know, we are all, you know, we're constantly exchanging information. Um, Mm -hmm. I write about it in chapter 15 on interpersonal resonance. Now, the way we communicate with each other, we're communicating, our bodies are communicating with each other through electromagnetic and quantum mechanical energies all the time. So when there's no way we cannot benefit from a client uh, when we they're healing and when we're resonating with them, mm. you know. And and uh, so I think it's personally it's 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 beneficial. Um, and then I also know that the uh, the ability to tolerate opposites mm. uh, is a requirement for spiritual enlightenment. Mm. Uh, uh, the the uh, which to me is an awareness uh, that transcends the physical body or the subtle body, mm-hmm. and 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 uh, to own the body of the universe is one's own, mm-hmm. you know. Mm. And uh, it uh, the I completed training in Istanbul online, Mm -hmm. Sunday. And Monday morning, I was just looking out the window and then I got into the space um, where I was everywhere, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And everything looked extremely beautiful for no reason. Even Mm -hmm. the, even the, you know, the mess on my desk (laughs) that you cannot see, right? Everything, the, 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 the trees, the the barren trees, everything, mm-hmm. you know, the house that I would go, uh, what an ugly house, that's beautiful. Mm. Because I'm at a level where it, it, uh, my sense of self is not identified with the, you know, the lower bodies, yeah. uh, including the brain. So mm-hmm. that came for, after four days of working with very difficult um uh, emotions in people mm-hmm. and uh, so I, it's not just evolving my um, healing myself in this on this planet uh, in this life from the traumas I've had in this life or previous lives but it's also a preparation for um, 
you know, constantly evolving toward uh, the, the expansion of one's awareness toward mm -hmm. the state of enlightenment. Mm -hmm. So I think that's why I, I, I feel so fulfilled doing it. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. yeah. I love that. Thank you for that yeah. answer. You're welcome. You're welcome. And one final little two-part question that you can take as two individual questions or all one. I'm just interested in both what's next is that just more training is there any more books on the horizon what's next for you and also what would you really like to see happen with your work in terms of exposure or notoriety or yeah. you know increasing yeah. what, what's the kind of future looking like for you i would imagine that i would continue to uh evolve this method and write more about it hmm. uh, because you know a work uh it just happens to us no uh, if it happens to us, and like a, an idea of a sculpture uh, or a painting appears to an artist, mm -hmm. and then they start to they start to chisel it away, mm -hmm. and then sometimes other people join them, mm -hmm. and then it takes shape and becomes a beautiful sculpture. It takes a lifetime, and um, a piece of work is like that. It just got. It, the inspiration is there, planted in one's brain. Devapria, WhatsApp audio. We don't know where it comes from, and that's mm -hmm. what uh, you know. Uh, everyone says that you know, uh, in, mm -hmm. in Larry Dorsey's book on creativity. Where did the idea come from? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then we spend uh, somehow we have spent a lifetime you know, learning different things, uh, having the right tools, so to speak, to bring that central idea in one's life purpose into manifestation. Mm -hmm. So this work is evolving. Yeah. In a way, uh, I've written a book, but it's, uh, it feels as though I've just started it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, in teaching it and other people practicing it, uh, I think it's going to evolve more and more. And there could be a book just at this level. Mm -hmm. If not... The next level where it would be, I'll bring the other levels in, energy, so, uh, can't write a book on uh, emotional embodiment and energy psychology, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. emotional embodiment and spirituality and so on. So I'm mm -hmm. actually doing a workshop in Bulgaria as a preparation. Uh, I've taught uh, in a workshops on trauma and spirituality. I might mm -hmm. very well, um, emotion and spirituality. Uh, in Romania, I'm going to do a workshop there. So. I think I can see different strands and each of those strands could lead to a book or not. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very interesting or not because uh, somehow the understanding has also evolved that, uh, you know, uh, that something is being created through me. No, it's not that I am an, I as an actor is doing anything. And Damasio says that in his book, The Feeling of What Happens, the sense of self is also arbitrary construction of experience. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's why I say I'm not with myself or I'm more with myself. If it were a permanent thing, we wouldn't feel that way. That's an, also an experience, mm -hmm. but there's just an awareness. Mm -hmm. And then if you closely follow the awareness, you get into a state that I got into on Monday, that yeah. I'm everywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, so I don't know where it's going to go, but wherever it's going to go, I'm okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. I love that. I mean, I'm going to put in a secret pledge for more books, so I'm just going to put that one out. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please, to that. <laughs> and, and, the, and the second question, I forget, what, what, what is it? Just it's, in terms uh, of what would you like to happen for your work? Like, would you like more yeah. notoriety? Who would you like to... What's the kind of, like, yeah. where would you like it to land? Well, I can... Uh, I, you know, where I would... I would like more people to use the method yeah. not just in therapy but in daily life yes yeah you know i just got a, a an email today from someone who read it in canada who's from sri lanka who wants to translate the book into tamil <laughs> to to make it available to sri lankans who have gone through horrible civil war amazing yeah i would like to you know so i would like this knowledge yeah. not, to spread because there's yeah. for uh to be helpful because not for anyone's glory no you know no no, no. my you know it's because i don't i feel as though it's just as, as though I'm, I'm gone past it even though i get, get caught up in the ego from time to time i sincerely believe that it can be of help and that people can benefit from it 
So, right. yeah, that's where I would like, uh, you know, I say, uh, use it as a complementary modality in every modality you do. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I would second that. It is very much, you can add that this into anything that you do, no matter what your discipline. And yeah. I, I really... And I say, and I say, uh, so here's a primary modality, whatever it is, psychoanalysis, a Jungian psychology, somatic experiencing. When you run into emotion, right, take a day to through the practice of embodying emotions and see yes. how things improve. And then I say, if your process, primary process is shut down a little bit, difficult, take a day to look for an emotion, work with it, <clears throat> and come back to your primary process and see how much it flows. Because it opens the body mm -hmm. to a emotion, mm -hmm. cognition, behavior. So everything will flow and improve. And that's mm -hmm. the, yeah. Um, now, <clears throat> it's not an easy method for people. Mm -hmm. because it involves uh, going deep into uh, the suffering. And the way I motivated by saying, if you think of a path up a mountain that goes around the mountain in mm -hmm. concentric circles of decreasing, <coughs> decreasing diameter, mm -hmm. then think of ISP, uh, you know, using ISP to just... Uh, go from one spiral to the next spiral vertically. Hmm? <laughs> and, then, and then you can do this <laughs> with your method and then go up, you know, and some people might say it's arrogant, etc. But, you know, try it and then tell me whether it's possible. No, I love it. It's like the harder but quicker journey. <laughs> it's like making everything flow and then you can, then you can do your little detour. Yeah, and yeah. actually, the thing with that is that some of the clients will prefer that because every client I've had has always gone, wow, this somatic experiencing practitioner work is so damn slow. And I'm like, yeah, because we're working at the pace of like body. But I love the kind of shortcut approach, <laughs> the yeah. difficult but shortcut approach. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, there are, just to let you know, mm. yeah, I have quite a few ISP practitioners in Austin. Oh, wow. Well, I'm going to get that list from you. I'm also going to put all the links. So we'll link to all the books we've mentioned, Candice Pert and um, whatever else we mentioned. I'll get those in the show notes as well and make sure that your book's linked and any of the courses that you've got coming up and we'll just link to your website so people can find things. That'd be um, great. www.integralsomaticpsychology.com is the website. Yes, amazing. And we will spell that in the show notes for people so they don't have and all there the are, kind of... There are articles in the blog section, yeah. you know, in different languages, so... Amazing. And I love this different languages thing. I've actually got a couple of French students at the moment and some of the concepts don't translate easily. And I'm like, I don't know. I don't know how to say this in French. So like, mm -hmm. it's, it's great that this is kind of coming to different languages because that is the thing that will help it spread, especially to places that need it. So this is amazing. Thank you so much for spending time with me today. I have loved that conversation. And I, I just know our listeners will have found so much value from that. Thank you so much. I really had a great time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. Bye bye. Mm -hmm. I was so inspired by this conversation with Dr. Raja Selvam, and I hope that you were too. If you are interested in reading his book, the link is in the show notes to Amazon and his website. The Practice of Embodying Emotions is an easy read. It is a really lovely story about the evolution of one person's journey through developing this method and then finding out that it really works. And that's the beauty of this. This is an experiential, experimental, therapeutic tool, which really has been shown to demonstrate real impact in the clinical setting. And I would really encourage any clinicians watching to dig into this for yourself beyond that anything that i mentioned today about kuya can be found at kuya.life and anything about the unveil academy can be found currently at the unveilacademy.com if you are interested in joining the unveil community where we chat about these episodes and we dig deeper into the theories and the evolution of this practice and these therapeutic modalities then please join us at unveilcommunity.com and with that all that's left to be said is that if you found value in this episode please like subscribe and share with anyone who you think might also benefit from listening to Dr. Raj's words. And I will be with you next time here on the Unveil podcast.